we'll hope that is. We'll, we'll turn uh, together to Matthew uh, chapter 8. Uh, so we've returned to our series in Matthew's Gospel uh, a couple of Sundays ago. Uh, we're taking up uh, the passage from Matthew 8 from verse 5. And uh, I hope you'll have it open in front of you. Growing up just a, a little bit north of here, I had many opportunities to travel along the Murray Valley Highway and between Wodonga and Rutherglen, if you know that stretch of the road, there are two grand homes. Uh, and travelling along the highway, the Murray Valley Highway, I wondered each time I went past whether I'd rather live in the one on the south side of the highway or the one on the north. Uh, one of them, uh, Olive Hills, uh, is a more classical style of house with a big tower uh, and Fairfield on the other side is, is another stunning building. Oh, and Florence had relatives at one of them. I'd better be careful what I say then, hadn't I? Oh, well, it's, it's well known. I wondered because it's a little bit out of, out of the district how well the place would be known. Well, I heard this story. And I'm pretty sure it's true because I read it in the Border Mail. Uh, in 1901, the year of Federation, a very important visitor was coming to Rutherglen. He'd been the Governor of Victoria and he was the first Governor General of Australia, the Earl of Hopeton, and he was going to visit Rutherglen. And so, of course, the owners of these two great houses invited him to stay. The question then was who would have the honour? The day came. The Governor-General came along the road and turned into Fairfield to dine. And once he'd had dinner, he gave his apologies and went across the road to stay at Olive Hills. Uh, and so the rivalry continued. Neither family could say, well, we got the Governor-General and you didn't. But I wonder if someone important was coming to town, whether it's at the Queen, sports person, a celebrity that you look up to, would you invite them to stay at your place? I know there are lots of important people that I would love to sit down and meet and have a conversation with, but if they stayed at my place, they would know how tidy we kept it. They would know uh, all sorts of things about our lives that actually really I probably wouldn't want them to know. They would see just how ordinary our ordinary lives are. Uh, if that's how we would feel about an important person coming to, to our place, uh, how would we feel about Jesus coming to us? Uh, see, among all of the different options and different ways we might think about Jesus, the most impossible is to dismiss him and say he's not important. Uh, whether we believe he is who he said he is or not, we cannot dismiss him from the pages of history. And when we believe what he says about himself in the Bible, we realise he is God himself who has come to us to save us from our sin. And if we would be uncomfortable with uh, someone from... One of those TV cooking shows eating a meal at our place or, or a celebrity coming to meet us. How uncomfortable would we be with the God of all of the universe if he wanted to enter into our lives? Would we feel we deserve that? Well, the man that we meet here in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 13, knows he doesn't deserve to have Jesus come into his life. And yet Jesus promises him and promises us that he's come to have a place with us forever. Our shame and guilt tell us that that's not the way it should be. And that we cannot be in the presence of God in all of his holiness. We might try to get rid of our guilt, to ignore it, to drown it out to downplay God's holiness, perhaps. But when we meet Jesus, he proves he has the authority to do what we can't do. And so today, my aim is to help us all recognise Jesus' authority 
to speak powerfully and to determine our destinies. We need to recognise Jesus has the authority to speak powerfully and to determine our destiny. So let's hear the powerful promises and the trustworthy warnings that Jesus gives us here. First of all, in verses 5 to 10 and verse 13, we hear how Jesus speaks powerfully. Right before this, Jesus has met a powerless man who asked him for help. And we saw last time how Jesus was both able and willing to make him clean. But here in verses 5 and following, we find a man who should be far from powerless. Uh, He's a Roman centurion commanding a large group of soldiers. But notice what he says here in verses 5 and 6. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, that's the town he moved to after he grew up in Nazareth, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralysed, suffering terribly. And so this powerful man comes to Jesus. He knows that Jesus is worth Asking. Uh, He acknowledges Jesus as the Lord. The commander of Roman forces sees that Jesus is worth honouring. But why has he come to Jesus? Is Is he seeking to network with an influential member of the local community? Or does he have a theological question that he needs answered? He's asking for help. Uh, Who needs the help? Is it him? Is it a a loved one? It's No, it's one of his servants. Very unusual in these days. The Romans treated their servants as like a piece of farm equipment or, or a beast that happened to be able to talk. And yet this centurion has compassion on his servant. And he has the humility to approach Jesus for help. Do we do that? Or do we see that Jesus is the Lord and he is able to help us in even what seems to be the most impossible of situations? Well, how will Jesus respond if we come to him humbly asking for help? Look at verse 7 with me. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Jesus offers his help, and he's willing to help us too. He was willing to go, uh, even though there was bad blood between the Jews and the Romans. And even more amazingly, Jesus is saying he is able to heal this servant. He hasn't seen him. I don't know many doctors that would be happy to tell you over the phone, sight unseen, oh yes, I can fix that. And yet Jesus is confident that he can heal. And notice what the trouble is. This isn't a bit of back pain that comes and goes or or some other unseen illness. This man is paralysed. And you'll know whether Jesus is able to do what he says he can do. How different Jesus is from the fake faith healers of today. They scream the people who come to them for healing you. And yet Jesus is not put off by the greatness of this man's need. He's not put off by how great our need is either. Jesus is willing and Jesus is able. Notice that in verse 8. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I told this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Again, the centurion calls Jesus Lord. He doesn't just think of Jesus as a respectable person or even a great teacher or prophet. He sees that Jesus has 
authority. Jesus has authority. He has divine authority. The, emperor, uh, the centurion knows what authority is. I uh, don't know whether it's something in the Australian way of thinking, but we don't tend to like people who are in charge. We like to be able to take them down a, a notch or two. Uh, but this centurion had, in some cases, absolute power. As he gave a command, he had all of the authority of the Roman emperor behind him. But he sees in Jesus a greater authority. He sees the authority over people, over their lives, even over illness. Authority that only God can have. The centurion knows Jesus has this authority. He says to Jesus, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. And that's why he says, just say the word, my servant will be healed. Because Jesus has God's authority. And that's why the centurion trusted Jesus, absolutely. <laughs> if Jesus was just a good man or a great teacher, he, uh, Jesus wouldn't have have just let these words slip by. He'd have corrected the man. He would have said, well, look, you've got me confused with someone else. But does Jesus disagree? No. He, when he hears this in verse 10, he is amazed. He says to those following him, truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. See, the man doesn't just recognise Jesus' authority, he trusts him. He has faith in him. We have to be clear about what faith means. It's not just a feeling. Faith isn't just, hmm, yeah, I think things are going to turn out okay. As Romans 4 tells us, faith is a certain confidence that what God says is true. Being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he promises. That's faith. Knowing that what God says he will do. The centurion believed that, didn't he? But Jesus expresses amazement. Because here is a, a non-Jewish person expressing absolute trust in Jesus. And no one else in Israel amongst God's chosen people seemed to show faith like this man, Jesus. They had God's promises written down here. And they didn't seem to trust them. He'd given them his promises, and yet a foreign soldier believed them more than many others. He had great faith. We're going to circle back to that idea in the second point, because it is such a big thing. In fact, it almost overshadows the healing. Jesus stops at this point and speaks in verses 10, 11 and 12 about what that faith means. And then the healing of the man is sort of just tacked on at the end there in verse 13. But we're going to jump down and come back to verses 10 to 12 in a moment. See, it's, it's one thing to have faith. But we trust in people who let us down all the time. Will Jesus let down this man? Is his faith misplaced? But no, we, we can be certain that Jesus will fulfil our hopes when they come from his word. Look at verse 13. With you. Then Jesus said to the centurion, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Remember, Jesus hasn't seen the paralysed servant. He isn't even nearby but he does see the centurion's faith and sends him home. No instructions for something magical to do when he gets there. He can just go. Why? Because Jesus' powerful words heal the servant. Exactly what the centurion had hoped for. Jesus commands to happen. Let it be done. Notice, 
Jesus isn't saying the centurion's faith caused the healing. Uh, Jesus' ability to heal the servant didn't depend on the greatness of the centurion's faith. Uh, Jesus says, let it be done just as you believed it. He's saying, what you asked for will be done. Jesus has the authority to speak powerfully, to heal in amazing ways. He can do all his holy will, and that's not limited by us. We see Jesus' powerful word. It calls us to approach him humbly, like the centurion did, to embrace his willingness that Jesus shows here, to recognise his divine authority, to trust him absolutely, and to be certain he will fulfil our hopes when they're based on his promises. That's all well and good. What if we don't have a sick servant at home? What if our biggest problems aren't a physical illness? Does Jesus say anything about us, about our lives, what will happen in the end? We find as Jesus sees this man's faith in verses 10 to 12, that he looks beyond the immediate problem to how life is going to end up for us. We hear how Jesus determines destinies in verses 10 to 12. See, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is amazed by the centurion's faith. He knows Jesus has God's authority to speak, to fix the brokenness that is in God's world because of human sin so much bigger than stopping people from being sick. Jesus is here to heal the sin that cuts us off from God. That's why he healed people, to show he was coming to do something bigger, that we can be a part of God's new creation, where God will live with his people forever. So believe Jesus' promise of heaven which we find here in verse 11. We've sung about that wonderful hope already a number of times this morning. We don't do it very often. Maybe we should sing a bit more because where we're going will shape the way we live on the way. Notice here in verses 10 and 11, Jesus links faith in him with entering the kingdom of heaven. That's because the only way to get there is true faith in Jesus. It says in John 14, no one comes to the Father except through me. He mentions Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's he's picking up on promises God made long ago. Uh, Louise read some of them for us in Isaiah 25. How God's people would feast with him forever in the place where God himself will wipe the tears from our faces. How do we get there? Isaiah says only when he's removed our disgrace and shame and when he saves us by faith. Here, Jesus describes heaven as the place where believers share in a feast with God that God has prepared for him. He lists Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the, the forefathers of the Israelites, the Jewish people. But they're listed because they were men of faith. People who trusted God's promises to bless them and to bless the nations through them because of his undeserved grace. That's how you and I can come, whether we grew up east or west of Jerusalem, whether we're physically part of Abraham's descendants or not. Because from the very start, God's gospel promises have always been for all the nations. They've always been for those who will have faith. 
In Galatians chapter 3, Paul spells it out for us. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify or make right the Gentiles, the nations, by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. What's the gospel? All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. See, this has always been the good news. That in Jesus, the reality of heaven is ours by faith. No matter where we come from, no matter how great our sin, his mercy and his forgiveness are enough to save whoever trusts in him. Jesus is clear. When we have faith, this promise is ours. Our destiny can be the fullest possible unending life but only when we've stopped trusting ourselves to get there. Then it is ours, because Jesus promises it to us. We have Jesus' word. It's not a fantasy. It's a reality. When he cleanses us, when he saves us, then we have a place there too. A place beside Abraham and Isaac and Jacob with all who repent and believe in him. That would be a great place to stop, wouldn't it? But Jesus tells us the whole truth. He does not just give us the option of going to heaven. He also warns us against going to hell. And we need to believe that promise too. The fact is, Jesus says more about hell than he does about heaven. Hell is real. It is the other destiny. If we're not saved by him, we don't just fade away into nothing. We will be aware and we will be suffering away from anything good. Notice in verse 12, plenty of people you would have thought would be in heaven will end up there. The subjects of the kingdom or the the sons of the kingdom are the translations say. Those who belong to Abraham's family or another believing family and yet don't believe themselves. Being a covenant child, growing up in a Christian home will not get us there. Jesus says they'll be thrown outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says the punishment and torment are the destiny of everyone who does not trust in him, even the good ones, even the religious ones. A conscious existence filled with unending sorrow, regret, misery, despair, anger and pain. It will not be a party with your mates. And Jesus determines which destiny will be ours. He is the one who welcomes people into the kingdom of God. He says in Matthew 25, He will send everyone who does not believe into the eternal fire. Do you know which destiny is yours? Will you feast with Abraham in the place Jesus prepares for you? Will you weep? And grind your teeth forever. Jesus tells us here that you can know. That you can be sure today where you will spend eternity. The difference is whether we have faith. Whether we trust Jesus' promises to save us when we turn to him. Turn away from our sin. Jesus knows our biggest problem is not physical paralysis. It's a spiritual paralysis. It's the inability to do or be or choose what is good. The Bible calls it being spiritually dead. 
but in the same place it describes us as spiritually dead, it goes on to say, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Yes, God is a righteous judge, a holy judge, but he is also gracious and loving and merciful, and he gives us the life we can never create in ourselves. By grace, you've been saved. We've seen Jesus' great love here, haven't we, in Matthew chapter 8. And we've seen how Jesus speaks powerful to heal the suffering that made that servant's life a torment. But we can also see Jesus' love and mercy and his grace that extends beyond this life. How Jesus determines our destiny. Do you hear his powerful word? Do you recognise that he is the turning point to heaven or hell? Do you recognise, do you believe, do you trust that he is the one who determines whether we are saved from the wrath to come? Are you depending on Jesus to bring you into the kingdom of heaven? If you are, then you can rejoice in his wonderful promises. A feast with all of those who believe from east and west. And if you don't hear his warning today, you don't go into the outer darkness. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we... Thank you for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for your gift of faith that helps us to see things as they truly are, to trust your promises, to know that what Jesus says has power, that from his divine authority he can speak and grant healing and new life to us. Thank you also for his faithful words and his trustworthy warnings about the destiny that awaits us all. Our Father, thank you for telling us and warning us about what will come to those who do not believe. Rescue many, we pray. Use our faltering words to point them to the Saviour and help us to rejoice in the trials of this life and even in its joys of the greater rejoicing that is awaiting us, of that wonderful feast that you have prepared so that we will enjoy all of the goodness of the new creation in the presence of those who before us have believed and in your glorious presence with your Son and your Holy Spirit, blessed forever. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name.